appropriate number, may I invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of John chapter 14. John chapter 14, and when you have that marked, uh, maybe you might uh, want to mark also 1 John chapter 5. John 14 and 1 John chapter 5, and we'll get to those verses momentarily with point number one when we get into the body of our sermon. Thanks, uh, Brother Tom, for directing the song service this morning, and good morning, brethren. Our thanks also, my personal thanks to Joey and to Josh, and Josh, thank you for allowing me to fill the pulpit this morning. Our best to your uh, lovely family and uh, the good work you're doing, the great work you're doing right here at Pyburn Street, and I'm uh, delighted that you're here, and I know the brethren are delighted that you're here, and it seems like a perfect match between the Pyburn Street uh, congregation and Josh and Christy and their children, uh, all constituting the wonderful brethren right here at the Pyburn Street Church of Christ. Shannon and I were with you last uh, this past October to celebrate my mother's birthday, and uh, we're just honored to be back with you. Glad that we can worship together this morning. Uh, again, thanks to Josh and to David and to Tom for the opportunity to fill the pulpit. I'm always honored to preach the word. I know that you'll hear the word, and as I said the last time I was here, when the preaching of the word and the hearing of the word come together, you've got an acceptable act of worship to God, and that's what we always want. We never want anything less than an acceptable act of worship to God. Thanks to my cousin uh, David for presiding at the table and the reading from Matthew 27, and thanks to my long-time friend, David Lemons, for reading from Matthew chapter 7. David, thank you. Matthew 7, 15 through 23. And with, oh, I think maybe point number four a little bit from now, we'll dive back into Matthew chapter 7, which will serve as the proof text for that point. Got a lot of our family here today. Uh, Shane and I got in late Friday night, and uh, we were with mother and dad for the weekend. We'll have a big family meal after services this morning, and then we've got a about a five and a half hour drive back to Birmingham tonight and to get back with our local work uh, there uh, in Birmingham. Me with the Shades Mountain Church of Christ and Shanna works for Brookwood Hospital in Birmingham. But we're honored to be here. I'm honored by your being here and I know with all my heart that God is honored by our being here to worship him in spirit and in truth. Again, I hope your Bibles are open to Gospel of John chapter 14. And also a finger or a marker of some sort in 1 John chapter 5. John 14, 1 John chapter 5. Now I will be the first to acknowledge that our title this morning, Not Everyone. That title, brethren, is very exclusive. There are no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Not everyone. That expression is very, very exclusive. We're living, and may I tell you what you already know. We're living in a current culture. We're living in our modern society that is governed more by a definition of and an idea of and a concept of inclusion that is not biblical, that does not dovetail with the Word of God. And so, again, I would be the first to acknowledge that the title of our sermon and the body of our sermon Again, not everyone, what will follow from that, what will flow from that momentarily, would not be viewed favorably by many, if not most, sadly, in our current culture and our modern society. Again, you and I are not opposed to uh, being inclusive. We're, we're certainly not imposed to, to be inclusive. But their idea, their definition, their concept of inclusion does not dovetail with the Word of God. It does not, David Match, does not dovetail with a Christian, a biblical worldview. And always, that is our deepest concern. What is right? What is biblical? What matches with reality? The reality formed by a Christian, a biblical worldview. And so many, if not most, would have problems with what I'll say today. But I will not apologize for it nor would you apologize for it. We believe in inclusion, we believe in exclusion, but we believe in both of those concepts, their definitions, their concepts, their ideas in light of the Word of God. So follow closely this morning with open minds and open Bibles as we delve into that theme of the hour. Not 
everyone. Not everyone. We're in John chapter 14, point number one this morning. Brethren and friends, let me tell you what you already know. Not everyone loves the Lord. Not everyone loves the Lord. It's quite easy to say, I love the Lord. Uh, Joey, I love God. I love the Godhead. I love my brethren. Peter tells us to love the brotherhood, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 13. It's easy, very easy for me, for you, for us to declare that openly and outwardly, brethren and friends. But it is another matter to actually, genuinely manifest love for God. Are you there? John 14 and verse 15. Circle it, underline it, highlight it, mark it in your Bible. If you haven't already done so, our Lord said very simply, if you love me, keep my commandments. You can memorize that right now if you've not already done so. Brother Don, I know you have. If you love me, keep my commandments. If we really love the Lord, we will be commandment keepers. I have never... David, nor will I ever apologize for being a commandment keeper. I have no problem with that whatsoever. That doesn't bother me one little bit, being a commandment keeper. And I intend to be a commandment keeper, a keeper of the commandments of God every day of my life. And when I fail and falter, and I do and you do and we do from time to time, thank God for his grace and mercy and the avenue of prayer where we can come in contact as his children with the everlasting blood of the Lord himself and find the forgiveness of our sins. But then we'll pick up where we've left off and we'll continue to keep the commandments of God. If you love me, keep my commandments. But not everyone loves the Lord. If they did, brethren, Mike, if they did, they would obviously keep his commandments. But it is obvious to me, it is manifest by their conduct Again, may I draw on what David read a moment ago from Matthew 7, 15 and 16. We'll highlight later verses in a moment. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? They do not. You shall know them by their fruits. If everyone truly loved the Lord, then... They would indeed keep his commandments, but the fact that they are not keeping his commandments indicates to me and to you that they do not really love the Lord. Oh, that's very judgmental, Brother Mel. It's biblical, brethren, from start to finish. That's very exclusive. Indeed it is, and no apology coming from you or me or us for doing that, for saying that, for declaring that, and for living that. John, the Apostle John, heard our Lord, heard our Lord Say what he said in John 14, 15. And some decades later, he said in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3. For this is the love of God, that you keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous, the King James says. They are not burdensome, more recent translations have. Again, the apostle John heard our Lord declare John 14, 15. And some decades later, he drew upon that, moved by the Spirit of God, Matthew, and said almost the identical thing, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. In other words, Josh, we have the capacity, we have the capability to keep the commandments of God. And when we do so, guess what? We love the Lord. If you love me, keep my commandments. It's really not a matter of judgment. And again, John 7 and verse 24 says, from the lips of our Lord recorded by, recorded by John, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. We're not negatively judging, judging, and Joe, if I can put it like that, the right kind of judging ought to be done by us as it's drawn from the very word of God. Three chapters earlier in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3, the same John to the same brethren said, and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. How do we know that we know the Lord? By keeping his commandments, 1 John 2 and verse 3. Now to know the Lord, to know God biblically, according to the testimony of the New Testament, means we're in a right relationship with him. How do we know that we're in a right relationship with God himself? 
if we keep his commandments a third and final time. Hereby we do know that we know him, 1 John 2, 3, if we keep his commandments. There is so much emphasis in the word of God on commandment keeping. May I draw your attention quickly as we wind down point number one this morning to two or three verses that you will recognize immediately. From the pen of the wise man Solomon. The book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13. There the wise man said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. What? Fear God and keep his commandments. In Matthew chapter 15, beginning with verse 1, here's what we read again from the pen of Matthew and we'll have the words of our Lord included in some of this uh, testimony. Matthew 15, 1 and following. Here's what Matthew recorded, Jadon. He said, then came to Jesus. Again, I'm quoting from the King James. You follow along in your Bible. Then came to Jesus, scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Our Lord David didn't skip a beat. Verse 3 of Matthew 15. Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition. What a turnaround by the Lord, the master himself, the master logician, and he demonstrated it right there. Now drop your eyes down. We don't have time to look at all of the context here. Drop your eyes down to verses 7 through 9. We're still in Matthew chapter 15, 7 through 9. Note what our Lord says there. You hypocrites, you know it, Matthew 15, 7, 8, and 9. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you saying, and then if I may interrupt myself, our Lord quotes from Isaiah 29, verse 13. What? These people draweth nigh to me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. Matthew 15, 1, 2, and 3, and 7, 8, and 9. Brad, again from the very word of God. The point we're making is, again, the extinction of John 14, 15, where our Lord said, if you love me, keep my commandments indeed. And so we really, truly, genuinely love the Lord, we'll keep his commandments. And there is so much emphasis on that in the Bible, Old and New Testaments. We've noted Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and then Matthew 15, 1, 2, and 3, and 7, 8, and 9. Like then, 2,000 years ago, like then, the majority of people, even religious folk, are inclined toward doing what? following, keeping the traditions of these folks and those folks. But in vain, our Lord said, do they worship me, teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. They're following the commandments of men rather than the commandment of God. Not everyone loves the Lord. Finally, and point number one, the longest of our points this morning. 1 Corinthians 14, 37. There Paul wrote to the church of God at Corinth. 1 Corinthians 14, 37. If any man think himself to be spiritual or a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge, 1 Corinthians 14, 37. If any man think himself to be a prophet or a spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are what? The commandments of the Lord. That's what we've got right here. What I'm holding in my hand, a little Bible I've used since February the 7th, I believe, of 1995, every day of the week, my primary preaching Bible right here. And I have it hidden in my heart, the commandments of the Lord. And I hide it in my heart as you do in order that I might live it out day in and day out. And again, when I fail and falter, when you fail and falter, we turn again to the commandments of the Lord and we seek the guidance we need and we get back on the right path. It's really as simple as that. Point number two, not everyone believes and loves the truth. Not everyone believes and loves the truth. Won't you turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. We'll begin about midway down with verse 10. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. Because they received not the, get it now, love of the truth that they might be saved. 
And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12. Note what Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica. He said these individuals didn't love the truth, verse 10. They didn't believe the truth, verse 12. May I comment on that? If one does not believe the truth, they're not going to love the truth. And one who does not love the truth will not believe the truth. It cuts both ways and right through the center, dear brethren and friends. Not everyone believes and loves the truth. And may I tell you what you already know. The epitome of truth, the embodiment of truth, the essence of truth is Jesus Christ himself. He said in John 14 and verse 6, you know it, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, John 14 and verse 6, indeed. And in John 8 and verse 24, in the closing clause of John 8, 24, our Lord said, if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Why do you mention that, Brother Mel? I mention it because not everyone believes and loves the truth. Just as not everyone loves the Lord, even though they might declare they do, if they're not following his commandments, if they're not doing his commandments, they don't really love the Lord. Not everyone believes and loves the truth. And if we don't believe and love the Lord, we won't believe and love the word of the Lord. But when we believe and love the Lord, we are drawn toward believing and loving the word of the Lord. And when we truly believe and love the word of the Lord, we manifest to a lost and dying world that we believe and love the Lord, who is the author of this, the faith, once for all delivered unto the saints, Jude verse 3. Again, this is not a matter of dispute or debate if we really love the Lord, if we really believe and love the truth, point number two that we're covering at this moment. Now, may I remind you that the Apostle Paul in Romans 125 spoke of some, watch it now, Romans 125, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen, Romans 125. Now, we don't have time to look at the full context of Romans chapter 1. It is rich indeed. But you can look right there and see what follows in verses 26 and 27. And for this cause, God gave them over to vile affections for even their women, did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Likewise, the men also, I won't quote the rest of it, you know what is there and what follows. Paul's condemnation of homosexuality, of the homosexual lifestyle, of what we would more broadly say today, the LGBTQ agenda, the LGBTQ plus agenda that we are opposed to. We love everyone, but we don't love error. We don't love or like lifestyles that run counter to the very word of God. Now, when you look at Romans chapter 1 and follow the flow of Paul's argument there, his biblical argument, you note know this. Idolatry destroys morality. Idolatry destroys morality. I want to say it a third time. You, at your leisure, if I may give you an assignment, read Romans chapter 1 in addition to your normal devotional Bible reading today. Before you pray and pillow your head tonight, Read Romans chapter 1 in its entirety. Of course, when you read Romans chapter 1, David, you're going to have to read chapter 2. And then, dude, you're going to be right there in chapter 16 before it's all said and done. But at least read chapter 1. And you will see what who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And then his condemnation of uh, female and male homosexuality. Idolatry destroys morality. Or to turn it around another way, or view it in another way, idolatry leads to immorality. And brethren, may I, again, I know I say this repeatedly, may I tell you what you already know. One can involve themselves in idolatry by worshiping a false god, a false deity, or by worshiping the one true and living God in a false way. You engage, I engage, we don't, I'm, I'm using that as an example, but one can engage in idolatry by worshiping a false god, a false deity, or by worshiping the one true and living God in a false way. 
But that is not pleasing to our God. Not at all. You and I believe and love the truth, point number two. And because we do, we do what? Ephesians 4, 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, Ephesians 4, 15. We believe and love the truth, and thus we speak the truth, and we speak it in love. Love for the souls of men and women, boys and girls, drives us to tell people the truth, the truth of God's word. If we can be bold enough to talk uh, sports, and th- this is uh, Super Bowl Sunday, as you well know. Normally, uh, for about the last uh, 30 plus years, maybe close to 35 years, normally today I am preaching in Sardis, Tennessee. Uh, it's Freed Hardeman lectureship time. They canceled that this year. But for about the last 35 years, uh, I have attended the Freed Hardeman lectures the first full week of February. If not the whole week, I'm there for the opening days. And I try to be there Sunday before the lectureship begins. And I've had a long-standing invitation for year after year after year to preach for the Sardis, Tennessee Church that morning and the South Jackson Church of Christ that evening. But I'm honored to be here this morning. I'm honored to be here. Now, I mention that, brethren, because no matter the occasion, Super Bowl Sunday, the weather, what, it spit a little snow, David, as we uh, got in the van to drive here from mother and dad's this morning. I don't care what the weather is. I don't care who's playing sports, and I'll, I'll try to catch a little of the ball game as we're driving back tonight. I'll try to tune it in, Chuck, on, uh, on, on our radio in the van. I, I, I'll just tell you, I, I, I like Tom Brady. I'm a Tom Brady guy. Short guys like the tall guy. He's a good quarterback. But whomever you're pulling for, if you're pulling at all for anyone in the ball game, ultimately what matters is if we're bold enough to talk athletics, to talk sports, to talk the weather, to talk this, to talk that, we need to be bold enough to talk the truth. Not everyone loves the Lord, point number one. And not everyone believes and loves the truth, point number two. Point number three, dear brethren and friends, our time's getting away from us. I've got three more points. Let's move there quickly. They're shorter points. Follow me now. Point number three, not everyone is a child of God. Not everyone is a child of God. Now, if you would, in addition to reading Romans chapter one, before you pray and pillow your head tonight, read, if you would, in addition to that, Read another book and another chapter from that book, the Gospel of John, chapter 8. The Gospel of John, chapter 8. I'm in John, chapter 8, and verse 44. John recorded these words, but they're spoken by our Lord. And if you want to get the full flavor and context, you want to begin at least back around verse 38. We just don't have the time for me to quote that before you this morning uh, and to delve into it. But if you would, before you pillow your head and pray, and before you pray and pillow your head tonight, read Romans chapter 1 and John chapter 8. In John 8 and verse 44, our Lord said to those gathered before him, you are of your father the devil. Did you get that? You are of the, your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie. He speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it, John 8 and verse 44. Oh, Brother Mel, that is about as exclusive as you can get. Well, you are right there, indeed. And we make no apologies for the lecture of our Lord right there. Again, go back to verse 38 or even beyond that, before that, and get the full flavor at your leisure where our Lord is in that same a conversation with those same Jews at that time. Again, we always want to get the context. But we're highlighting primarily the opening words of John 8, 44, where our Lord told people, where our Lord told people before him, you are of your father, the devil. Not everyone is a child of God. Not everyone is a child of God. That is exclusive But I told you as we began this morning that our title, our title was very exclusive. And that many, if not most, in our common, our current culture, and in our modern society would disagree, would view this sermon, the title, and the message of the hour less than favorably because they have a view of inclusion that does not dovetail with the word of God. That's just a fact of the matter. 
the fact of the matter. So how does one become a child of God? My dad and my brother and I happened to be talking about Galatians, the book of Galatians last night, a great book written to the churches of Galatia. Those churches are the churches that Paul and Barnabas established as recorded in Acts 13 and 14 on their first missionary tour, including excuse me, churches like Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, and Derbe. Those fell into the larger Roman province of Galatia. And so there may have been more congregations than that, but at least those four fell into that Roman province of Galatia. And the letter, the book of Galatians, was written to them. Indeed, they're being besieged by Judaizing teachers, Jewish Christians who were binding elements of the law of Moses, primarily circumcision on Gentile brethren. And Paul faced them in Philippians, in the book of Hebrews, repeatedly through the New Testament, the Judaizers are at work. My judgment would be, and I would, I would qualify it as my judgment. You feel free to disagree. My opinion, my judgment would be that the primary false teaching group found in the New Testament in the first century, as indicated in the New Testament, were the Judaizing teachers. They are active. They are heretical. They are destroying churches. And Paul is combating that. And in Galatians 3, 26 and following, he says, for you are all the children of God by faith. The Greek literally says, by the faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Galatians 3, 26 through 29. For you are all the children of God by the faith in Christ Jesus. Indeed. One is either a child of God or a child of the devil. That may be viewed as uh, unkind and exclusive by many in the modern world, but we stand with it because it comes again from the word of God. One day we will all stand before our Savior, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, that everyone may receive the things done in the body according to that which he hath done, whether it be good or bad, 2 Corinthians 5.10. Brethren and friends, that sends a chill up my spine right now. The hair is raised on the back of my neck. I'm not scared of that day, of that date, of that time. I don't know when the Lord will return, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Matthew 24 and verse 36. But knowing that our Lord is coming again, but not knowing when our Lord will come again, I want to be ready for his coming again whenever it might be. And that means I'm going to do my best to know his book, and to live his book every day of my life. A week from today, I'll be 61 years old. Life is getting away from all of us, indeed. Indeed. And I hope, and I hope for my sake and your sake, Tom, that we have many, many more years to live and to breathe and to love and enjoy life and all of the possibilities that are before us. But if the Lord comes tomorrow, I'm going to be ready. If he comes 40 years from now and I'm alive, I'm going to be ready. But I'm going to be ready and you're going to be ready whenever that might be. And that means that we acknowledge that not everyone loves the Lord. Not everyone believes and loves the truth. Not everyone is a child of God. Now, if everyone is a child of God, then why are we engaged in evangelism? Why did Joey mention what he did by way of announcements a moment ago about what you're gathering and whom you're supporting and, and Josh, what y'all are doing here, what we're doing at Shades Mountain and every other congregation represented here this morning? If everyone is presently a child of God, Brother Wayne, then why in the world are we involved in individual efforts toward evangelism or collective efforts as the local church that belongs to Christ? Point number four, dear brethren and friends, not everyone. Not everyone who is religious, point number four, not everyone who is religious will be saved. Now we're back to part of the passage that Brother David Lemons read before us a moment ago. David, again, thank you for that. Matthew 7, highlight only, if you will, verses 21 through 23. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Well, I was glad to get that. I was glad to be able to preach here and get that mask off because I, I was about to... About to <coughs> <clears throat> about to do something, I, <laughs> uh, so um, <clears throat> I, I am hoping that uh, the vaccines, uh, Pfizer and Moderna and, 
and the others that will soon be available will have the desired effect. I believe they're already doing so and that we'll reach that uh, almost proverbial herd immunity and that we'll be back to a greater semblance of normalcy of what we knew before mixed and uh, than what we have now and have had for almost a year now. But uh, I thank you for your patience this morning. Again, point number four, we're in Matthew chapter 7. Not everyone who is religious will be saved. Matthew 7, 21 and following. Not everyone, here we find the language very explicitly stated. But whether explicitly stated or implicitly indicated, it's true nonetheless. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out demons, and in thy name done many wonderful works? Then will I profess unto them, note what he said, I never knew you. Not I know you not, implying he had once known them. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Do you think the Lord knows who belongs to him, Brother Josh? Yeah, he does. You better believe it. 2 Timothy 2, 19 For the firm foundation of, nevertheless, let me quote it correctly, nevertheless, the firm foundation of God standeth having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19. Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God, the old brotherhood, now defunct publication, firm foundation, uh, was begun in the 19th century by a brother who drew the title from 2 Timothy 2 and verse 19. Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God standeth having this seal. What seal, Paul? The Lord knoweth them that are his. Brother, I stand before you, one who belongs to the Lord. And I said every time I'm here, I I repeat it every time I'm here, and I'm glad to do so. I became the Lord's on Sunday night, a rainy, a cold Sunday night, February the 24th, 1974, right here at this building. I didn't respond to the invitation at the normal time. After the services, my grandfather was just to the right, uh, right behind Brother Brad there on the other side of those double doors. He had on a pinstripe suit. Uh, Frank Gould was fond of those pinstripes. I, I, I enjoy a pinstripe every now and then myself. I yanked on his left sleeve and said, Paul, I'd like to be baptized into Christ. And he told some of the gentlemen out there to tell the folks outside visiting to come on back in. He took my confession right over here, right over here, and he baptized me to Christ right there. Unless y'all, have y'all changed the baptistry out since 1974? You haven't. If you don't remember, then you haven't. <laughs> this is the same baptistry. We hadn't changed it either. Well, I... <laughs> Uh, Shades Mountain Church of Christ has been there for 60 years, and we're still using that same baptistry. We could use a new one, uh, but uh, I, I doubt it, David. It's probably the same baptistry. I hope it is. I hope it is. The Lord has known me for whatever that is since February the 24th, 1974, when I came to know him through obedience to his word, consummated in a baptism baby right here. And that made all the difference in the world in my life. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Not everyone who is religious will be saved. And to argue contrary to that would be to argue with the Lord himself. I mean, who's going to have the nerve to do that? Who's got the backbone to do that? To argue against the Lord. My goodness, alive. Point number five. And finally, this morning. Much to say, but uh, very little time to say it. Here we go now. Point number five. All under the title of... Not everyone, not everyone loves the Lord, John 14, 15. Not everyone believes and loves the truth, 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12. Not everyone is a child of God, John 8, verse 44. Not everyone who is religious will be saved, Matthew 7, 21 through 23. And point number five, and finally, this morning, my brethren, my friends, not everyone who prays will be heard. Not everyone who prays will be heard. Someone might be saying, well, Brother Mel, I was with you right up to that, but I can't agree with you on that. Well, hang on, because you'll believe the Lord. You'll believe Peter and Paul. I know you'll take their testimony if you won't take mine. Not everyone who prays will be heard. Let's begin in a more generic way with our final point this morning. Point number five, not everyone who prays will be heard. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back that up. I'm going to back up that point, that proposition with the word of God. Don't take my word for anything. 
Do like those folks in Berea. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. And that they received the word with all readiness of mind. And searched the scriptures daily. Whether those things were so. Acts 17 and verse 11 indeed. Never take my word for it alone. Always check what Brother Mel says. Brother Josh. Whomever is preaching. Well check it against the very word of God. So here we are, and we would, Josh and I, and, and no preacher that I know of who's faithful would ever indicate otherwise. Always check it against the Word of God. But I can tell you something, baby. What I say is going to be right with the Word of God. I'm not going to have my soul damned. I'm not going to damn my soul because I wasn't man enough, Christian enough, or whatever to preach the Word. So we're just going to lay it out like that. Begin with me in Ephesians 1, verse 3. The first of three passages, we'll put an amen to it, and point number five in the sermon will be yours. Ephesians 1, 3, you know it. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with, here we are, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. I have heard it all my life from my Paul Gould, from G.W. Allison, from uh, uh, Gary Colley and other preachers that served this congregation over many decades of my boyhood and teenage years and young adult and whatever. I heard the truth about that verse. All spiritual blessings reside in one place, one realm, one sphere, the in Christ Jesus relationship. What I'm suggesting to you is what you already know and believe, that prayer is one of those blessings. Prayer is one of those benefits, Brother Max. Prayer is one of those, we'll call it a perk, Kevin. Prayer is a perk, a benefit, a blessing we get because we are a child of God. How are we a child of God? Again, we already looked at, quoted Galatians 3, 26 and 27. It's something we enjoy. It's because I'm a child of God, Joy, that I can pray, my Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. As I was taught by my grandfather and by G.W. Allison, now we pray kind of a slightly modified version of the model prayer, Josh. Then the kingdom had not come, and our Lord taught them to pray, thy kingdom come. And I remember being in our junior high and high school class, and G.W. saying, now we would pray, thy kingdom increase. And that's always stayed with me. It's there. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom increase, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Again, the prayer that with, again, as I worded it there, we can pray it just like that. Add to it uh, your own heart's desire, your supplications, your intercessions. But I use that prayer daily. I use some form of that model prayer. If it was good then, David, it's good today indeed. But because I'm a child of God, not the devil, I can pray, My Father which is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now, Proverbs 15, 29, we're wrapping it up here. Proverbs 15 and verse 29 says in your Bible and in mine, the Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. That was true in the Old Testament, Proverbs 15, 29. And there is a parallel in the New Testament in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12. So you're going to want to connect in your mind, better yet in your Bible, Proverbs 15, 29 with 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12 and then the other way as well. And then connect that back to Ephesians 1 and verse 3. For the eyes of the Lord, we're in 1 Peter chapter 3. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil, 1 Peter 3, 12, connected to Proverbs 15, 29, and all of that connected back to Ephesians 1 and verse 3. Not everyone who prays will be heard. When you read 1 Peter chapter 3 in full, you know that even a Christian man who mistreats his wife according to Peter, moved by the Spirit of God, will have his prayers hindered. So men, think about that. Husbands, think about that. Even a child of God, if they abuse their wife, will have their prayers hindered. So you look at that at your leisure for more depth, and more meat uh, with regard to kind of flesh out what we've mentioned this morning. But may I say, in closing, not everyone loves the Lord. 
Not everyone believes and loves the truth. Not everyone is a child of God. Not everyone who is religious, not everyone who is religious will be saved. Again, those in Matthew 7, 21 and following, were they religious, Josh? They were, but religiously wrong. Were they sincere? I would never doubt their sincerity, but they were sincerely wrong. They were religiously and sincerely wrong. I, won't, I don't doubt it, but the Lord said, You've got to do the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Again, the closing clause of Matthew 7 and verse 21. And not everyone who prays will be heard. That is indeed exclusive teaching and preaching from the lips of our Lord, from Peter, from Paul, from different inspired writers. But it's true. It's always been true, and it always will be true. In the local church, to build up the local church, all of our sermons can't be in a negative direction, but I remind you, eight of the Ten Commandments are negatively worded. When you look at what Paul, the older preacher, says to Timothy, the younger preacher in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 15 and following, two of the three things he mentions there, and in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17, most of the things are negatively worded. But we need the positive and the negative teaching from the Word of God in balance, in a, a proper balance, in order to grow the local church. But at the end of the day, in the beginning of every new day, we always need the truth. We always need the truth. And ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers, boys and girls, men and women, here is the truth. Let's know it. Let's learn it, let's love it, let's live it, and let's hide it in our heart and draw it, draw it forth like a, a handkerchief or a pocket knife or whatever. Draw it forth from your person like something you would money you would pull from your pocket and use it every day. But if we don't know it, how can we use it? Make 2021. Here we are, the first Lord's Day of February of 2021. Know the book, learn the book, live the book, love the book, and use the book every day of your lives. The sermon is yours. If we can help you with your soul salvation, I'm going to be right down here. Uh, Josh is already right down over here. We'll be here if we can help you with prayer as a child of God or with your great confession and baptism, if you desire to become a child of God, please let Brother Josh or myself know and do so right now as together we stand and sing.